we just got back from youth convention. So I'm expecting a party in this place this morning, all right? We're going to have a fun time. Y'all get ready to worship with us. Now won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance. It's the exodus of my heart. Cause you found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. No Yahweh. Y'all sing this out with me. Cause you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah. Oh, you're sounding good. Come on. You have, you have led me through the deep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No. I mean, if God's taking you out of something this morning, let's sing this out. How by day the sign that you are with me. The fire by night is the guiding light to my feet. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. No, yeah. Oh, if you believe it this morning, y'all sing this out with us. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, you have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah, come on let's sing that again, to the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. Torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Yes, Jesus. Oh, yes, God. Isn't God so good this morning? Look, this song is all about God taking us from one place and leading us to another. He's done it before and He'll do it again. He's not an Old Testament God, He's a right now God. And I believe and I declare that He's gonna do something miraculous in your life this morning. If you believe that, let's get ready, let's sing this, come on. Yes. Cause you stepped into my Egypt, and you took me by the hand. And you marched me out in freedom, and into the promised land. Now I will not forget you, God. Now sing of what you've done. Death is swallowed up. If you believe it, let's sing it out. By the fury of your love, you stepped into my Egypt. And you took me by the hand. You marched me out into the promised land. Oh, come on. Now I will not forget you, God. Now sing of what you've done. Death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. Oh yeah, who is he? Let's sing this out. Cause you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus, thank you so much. Hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea. You have led me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every, y'all sing that out, come on, hallelujah, hallelujah, you have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I'm looking for somebody to testify what God's already done in their life. Come on, y'all. Oh, come on. I feel like there's a breakthrough happening this morning. We're almost there. We're about to push through. Woo! Yeah. Can somebody
somebody give me about five seconds of real praise? Can come somebody give me about five seconds of glory of the Egypt? Man, we're out of it. We're not stuck anymore. Come on. Yeah. You stepped into my Egypt. And you took me by the hand. You marched me out in freedom. Into the promised land. See, now, I, now I will not forget you, God. I will forget you, now, sing of all you've done. Death is, Death is swallowed up, up forever by the, by the fury of your love. Come on, y'all, give him a shout of praise this morning. Woo! Come on, come on. Oh, he's so good. Y'all, give him a shout this morning. Come on. Welcome Bay Assembly. So good to have you here this morning. You can be seated for just a second. I've got some good news for you. God is on the move right here today. If you're in need of a miracle, you've come to the right place because we believe that He is alive. He is present. Yes. He is ready. Yes. He is willing. Do I have anybody needing a miracle today? Amen. You're at the right place. Welcome to all of you. If you're a first-time guest, we want you to know how sincerely appreciative you we are of you being here today. Those of you watching on live stream, it would just delight us if you would reach out to us in the comment section. Put your name, where you're watching from. We'd love to reach back out to you. If you're here, first time guest this morning, would you just simply shoot your hand up real high? What about it? Yes, yes. We've got some folks here. We are thrilled that you are here. We are just a family of believers that love God, love each other, and helping each other do life together. That's what we do. And we're proud that you are a part of this. Listen, we've got some great things coming up, but I just wanted to celebrate. Anybody like celebration? Yeah. I think the church needs to celebrate. You rocked the house with your BGMC giving last week. Over, get ready for this, $800. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise. <laughs> I tell you what. Our missionaries love BGMC money. And get this, you have been faithful to support all of our missions outreaches. We believe at Bay Assembly that it's not just what God gives you, but can He trust you to release it into the whole world? And Speed the Light is doing amazing. Thank you for your support for Elizabeth. If you've not supported her one in 1,000 hitting tennis balls, just for Speed the Light, you have a chance and an opportunity to still do that. We were at youth convention. I'm just going to hit this because of um, the Speed the Light and the missions. We were at youth convention in Huntsville, Alabama. I had such a wonderful time. Students there gathered from all over the state of Alabama in one offering, in one offering, those students raised over $33,000 for Speed the Light. Come on, somebody. We're going to give you an opportunity um, weeks to come to give to that wonderful project. But I'm telling you, God is doing something, not only in Bay Manette, but all over the world. I know that Ukraine looks it just looks devastating, and it is. Uncertainty all around. But this is all a part of God's plan. Get ready, church. Keep your eyes looking up. The King of Heaven is coming back in glory. Amen? And we have much to do before He comes back. Well, ladies, this Thursday night, 7 o'clock, right here, 6.30, Come at 6 just to be safe. <laughs> 6 o'clock, right? We are having the ladies' um, meeting, and this is our life rally. 
Yet again, it's another way that these ladies are giving to missions. And these ladies are supporting missions and they're going to be taking uh, pledges. And if you have an opportunity before you come, our missionaries love gift cards. And when missionaries come from furlough and um, they are coming from off of the foreign mission field and they come home, they have nothing. They have to leave basically everything there. So our district gives them gift cards so they can go and purchase things that they need to set up housekeeping. So if you will bring gift cards any amount, it doesn't make any difference. Or just bring cash offerings or a check, whatever the case may be. Pastor Regina has reached out to many of you ladies. If she's not reached out to you and you want to do something, contact her. I promise you she'll plug you in somewhere. But it is very important. We're hosting all the churches of Baldwin County. I believe in you that you're going to show up for the kingdom of God and be supportive of what God is doing. So please do not forget that. Also, get this. Are you ready for it? Next Sunday, 1030. You know what I'm about to say. It's the blessing of the bikes. Come on, somebody. Ah, man. I'm so excited to ride my street glide up here and get it blessed. I'm telling you, we're going to be meeting outside. So I want you to dress comfortable. We're going to be having chairs set outside, worship outside. You're going to have um, some biscuits and sausage. And we're going to have a wonderful time. After it's all over and we bless the bikes, we're going to go on our annual Bay Bikers inaugural ride. And we're going to go and there's going to be people coming from all over different uh, motorcycle associations, people saved, people lost, people that look like me, people that don't look like me. That's who we're after. So I want you to come. Please be praying that God would move in a miraculous way. So you be a part of that, and I know God will bless you. When we went to youth convention, and I just want to give a shout out to Pastor Ethan for just doing a phenomenal job leading our kids. Will you give it up for Pastor Ethan? I'm telling you what, this was probably one of the best youth conventions that I have had a privilege of being a part of. Pastor, I know that you're young, but you still go to youth conventions? Yeah. Well, I, I do, and this is the reason why. I feel it very important that our young people see their pastor beyond just this, but rubbing shoulders with them, having conversation with them. They see me worshiping. They see me getting in, right? So we, would, we had the privilege of going two inches at least of snow. We had snow fights. God moved in a supernatural way. God, listen, God is calling some of our young people to ministry. We had young people raise their hand, feeling that God is tugging at their hearts to become missionaries. This is a season where God is calling everyone into the whitened harvest field. Amen. And it's because of your generosity and your valuing our student ministry our Bay Kids, and everything that goes on that we're able to do this. I just wanted to applaud you. God is doing amazing things. We had young people raise their hand saying they committed themselves to Jesus Christ. We, listen, we had children that are displaced from their homes and in other people's homes. They may have never experienced the presence of God like this in their entire life. They raise their hands saying, I want Jesus Christ to be Lord of my life. Come on. That's what we're all about. Amen. So I want you to be encouraged. I want you to get plugged in. If you are not, this is the season for you to get plugged in. I want you to stand back up with me. I want you to know that God is in the business of doing something supernatural in this house. I sensed a shift in the move of Holy Spirit probably at the beginning of this year. It's been spoken over us that this year was going to be the year of harvest. 
there have been things that would contradict that circumstances that would stare you in the face and it would seem like it would be the Goliath that would cause you to dwarf back and to become isolated but I'm telling you the faith upon the word of God the faith that if he said it he will do it raise your hands and just simply say God I believe you're going to do it in me he's just looking for somebody is there the spirit of a Mary that he can deposit in your womb something that is unexplainable something that is supernatural is there a spirit of a David that will take the normal sling and stone and anoint it to be able to slay the largest competitor that you have ever faced I still believe God Father as we move into this time of worshiping you I pray that you would sense our passion our desperation for you to move in our lives and I pray oh God that you would capitalize on our faith as we just release it toward you here's our praise may it be a sweet fragrance in your presence
some of you in here some strength right now in this moment it's giving some of you some strength maybe not physical strength maybe a little bit of strength in your prayer life giving you some strength in your mental capacities that's what I'm sensing right now strengthen our bodies that way we can better affect your kingdom Stay 
in a heart of worship. He wants to encounter you right where you are. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never let me down. He's faithful to generations, so I would he fail now, yeah. You will never fail, you will never fail. You will never fail, you will never fail. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I feel my life on Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful. So I, so I Come on, now you say something like this. He, he won't. He won't. He won't. He won't. He won't. Yes. He won't fail. He won't fail. Everything around me, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me He's faithful generations. So Say I'm gonna make it I'm gonna 
house is built on you. My house is built oh, on you. And Christ is my, my firm foundation. Yes, the rock on which I when stand. Everything when around everything around me says, I've never been more alive. Because I put, I put my, my faith in Jesus. And he's never
is never lost. A battle is never lost. Your 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 battle is never lost. success he's with you when you have nothing he's never he's never lost your battle 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 even when you couldn't your battle even when you couldn't fight it on your own he's never lost your battle your battle he's never lost your battle so with power you say go in listen to the sound Power on your lips for you. And Jesus has broken your curse. And he is never lost. None of your battles. And you can say, Who are you, great mountain, that you should not bow low? And Jesus defeated your dark. Is never lost a battle. If you can get your hands up, just thank him. When we get to heaven, we'll be laying trophies at his feet of battles that we have won. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the great champion of our fight. You and you alone are worthy. God wants you to understand that He is actively working on your behalf. This course, old school, came to my heart. And I asked Elizabeth just to stay on this course or that chord. And I want you to sing. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sing it one more time hit the chord once on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand I believe there's hope being deposited in this house. Faith, encouragement, victory. We are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Somebody shout, I'm going to make it through. Now let's do that one more time. If you don't mind me saying, can we say that Pentecostal style? I'm going to make it through. I'm going to make it through. Woo! Give your neighbor a high five, a handshake, a neck hug, and let them know you're going to make it. Ha, 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 ha. Woo! You might be seated in the presence of the Lord if you can. If you can. What an honor. What an honor. Aren't you thankful for just the fresh move of Holy Spirit? 
I'm so sick of religion. I'm so sick of form without fire. I am. I just want Jesus. I, I, that's all I want. Uh, <laughs> come on. You can have the whole world, but just please give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Lord, you better stop, Murtis. I'm going to strike up on another one. <laughs> hey, listen. Um, the blessing of the bikes. Let me just share this with you before we move on and transition. You may not ride a bike. I, I get it. You may not even, uh, motorcycles or trikes may scare you. But um, here's the deal. We are about ministering to people that may not fit our mold. So you may say, well, Pastor, I, you know, I don't need my bike blessed, you know. Uh, but what I would ask of you is to be here to support those bikers that are going to come and let them know what, wait for it, real church looks like. Amen? Because real church is what's out there, not what's in here. That's why every Sunday we say, let's go have church. Because this is just to fuel you up. So you can empty your tank so you can come back and get fueled up again. And it ain't costing you as much here as it does the pump. I got some of your attention for the first time. Amen. Look, we are very appreciative. Kaylee brought some guests with her this morning. And uh, we are just super glad that you're here. And uh, um, Cameron and Caitlin brought some friends. Brad, I didn't get to meet Brad's better half. Samantha, greetings, my name's Steve, and this is us. <laughs> we, we, we welcome you, Brad and Samantha. you want to get to know them. And Lord, we have Carolyn, Carol, and Carl. No, um, Miriam, Miriam. I was getting with all the C's. Did you feel how that goes? Yes, yes. And who? Randall. Randall. See, I, I knew I better not do that. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just stomping all over myself. But um, it's important for me to let people know that we don't take you for granted. Um, and more than anything, and we mean this from all genuineness, if you leave here today and if you say, man, I felt Jesus, you may not be able to explain everything that you see or hear. That'll come. But we want you to have an experience with Christ. An experience with Christ. I told you last Sunday, man, didn't we have church last Sunday? What about it? God just shows up in supernatural ways. And um, that's, I, I don't want you to miss a Sunday because it's that Sunday that he's really going to show out. Right? I, I love to hear people say, man, I hate I missed that. You know, because everybody's just bragging on what God did. But um, I shared with you last Sunday that we are honored to have retired ministers. For, for me as a pastor to have retired ministers to come to this house and to, um, I guess, to validate what God's doing because they've been in the trenches, some of them, before I even said mama and daddy, right? Right? They were in the trenches when I was walking the pews uh, while we were singing out the Redbacks. Come on, somebody. Am I, am I talking to anybody that gets what I'm saying? So um, they have been fighting in the trenches. And I cannot tell you what an honor it is for me to have these caliber of men and women, generals of the faith, to be here with us. And this morning, we are in store for a wonderful honor. I've asked Brother Ron Hodge to come. God has blessed us with the Hodge family in more than one way. And I just, they remind me a lot of my mom and dad. And I, I don't know if that's the reason why I connected so quickly with them or what. 
but they have that same kind of spirit, that same drive, and the same passion to understand that God moves in different seasons with different generations, and uh, they too are so supportive of what God is doing. So I asked Brother Ron to come, and I know you won't preach him to death because you preach me to death, and he and Sister Darla helps preach me to death. So, uh, and that's a good thing, all right? When you say amen, that's like saying to me, sick him to a bulldog, right? I don't care if you say preach it, white boy, or whatever you say. I'm, I'm like, yay, <laughs> right? <laughs> we'll have a Jericho march sure as shooting. But um, I want you to put your hands together and put your whole heart into welcoming to this pulpit the man of God for this hour. Would you welcome Brother Ron Hodge to this platform? <laughs> Woo, come on. Yes. Worthy are you, brother. Hallelujah. I love you, friend. Oh, I love you. You take your liberty, okay? It is amazing to see how Holy Spirit sets things up. And I want to say to the praise team this morning, wow, you did a great job. And I really appreciate the word that you brought in song and in worship. And uh, I really appreciate the message Pastor brought last Sunday, making room. I hope you've been practicing that this week, making room for the presence of God, for Holy Spirit to come into your situation, into your setting, and to interact in your life in a very powerful way. As he was preaching that last Sunday, he, uh, he asked me on Tuesday to come and speak to us this morning. And I said, I know exactly what we are going to, sp to speak on today. And so I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel, the chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23 is an intriguing chapter, has the last words of David, and it also has a list of David's mighty men, 37 of them in all. And we're going to pick out one of them this morning and talk about his life and just allow Holy Spirit to speak into our hearts what he's already doing here in this worship this morning. The title of my sermon this morning is in a pit with a lion on a snowy day. I thought it was really interesting that Pastor and, the, and um, Ethan and all the young people went to the meeting in Huntsville, and it snowed on them. And uh, Darla and I left Alabama, and we went to Alaska where we spent 12 years, and then we moved from Alaska to the state of Washington, and so we've had our fair share of snow. And uh, the last year in central Washington, I finally said, I've had enough. And uh, I'm going back to where it's a little bit warmer. I forgot about humidity. <laughs> so we've already made plans to escape humidity for the summer, go back to West Virginia, where it's cooler up on the mountaintop, <laughs> you know. Let's look at the word this morning, 2 Samuel chapter 23, beginning in verse 20. Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, was a valiant fighter from Kabzal, who performed great exploits. He struck down two of Moab's best men. He went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down a huge Egyptian, although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. Benaniah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaniah, son of Jehoiada. He too was as famous as the three mighty men. He was held in greater honor than any of the thirty, but he was not included among the three. And David put him in charge of his bodyguard. You know, if you're going to write a resume to give to King David, you're looking for 
position in his bodyguard. I think that's a pretty good resume. Two of Moab's best men, a lion in a snowy pit on a, uh, on a slippery, difficult day, and one of Egypt's best men. That's a pretty good resume. But if you look at it, you know, I don't know about you, I'm not really keen about facing a lion on any given day. Unless it's safari and I have something that shoots about 300 yards and have a backup team of guys that are going to support me in case my shot is not good. But up close and personal, um, I'm not real keen about that. I think most of us would say facing a, facing a lion on any given day has to be classed as either really bad luck or life's greatest break. And I guess we all have different opinions about which one that is. Look at this man, Benaniah. He was a son of Jehoiada, and he was from a small village in the Judean hills, Kabzol. You know, the Bible is intriguing to me because it deals with people's names in unique ways. When it said that he was the son of Jehoiada, I looked at the name Jehoiada, and it means simply Jehovah knows. I look at Benaniah's name, and it, look, and it says his name means God has built. And you look at the village he's from, Kabzil, and it means congregation of God. I think that's a pretty good background if you're going to face a lion. Your dad is a one who knows Jehovah, and he's able to communicate to you who Jehovah is. And you come from the congregation of God, and you have the consolation that God has built me. The confidence to face the conflict, whatever that conflict may be. And not only that, you have faith enough to know the right place and the right time to face lions and to deal with them. Now, in a pit does not seem like the right place. A snowy day does not seem like the right day, and facing a lion really doesn't seem like the right occasion. I don't know much, you know, the Bible doesn't give us any details to this lion story. Very little information. But apparently this lion story was bigger than Scripture gives us here, and we could probably use our imagination. But for some reason, this lion was a large enough threat that Benaniah put his life on the line and went into a pit after him. A snowy day is not a bad day. It's an easy day to track him. It's an easy day to follow him. It's an easy day to find him. And so finding him uh, is not a problem. What are you going to do with him after you find him? You know? How are you going to confront him? Well, he's on his home territory. He's in a pit. It's probably his lair or his place where he lives. And it's a slippery, slick slope to go in after him. And the word says that Benaniah caught him. That's really up close and personal. That's closer than I want to be. Close enough to feel his breath in your face. Close enough to smell the, the, the stench of the, of the den where he lives. But Benaniah went after him. Here's a principle that I want us to take away from this this morning. That God's purpose is to position us uh, in the right place at the right time. His job for your life and my life this morning is to position us at the right place at the right time. I don't know about you, but I've been in some places where I didn't think it was the right place or the right time. But when God got done with it, I had a testimony. I had a praise report. I had a hallelujah to shout. God has a way of putting us there. A few biblical examples of that is Israel coming to the border of Cana. Ten spies come back with an evil report, 
and their negativity infected the whole congregation and everybody in that crowd began to cry and weep and, and mourn that they'd left Egypt. Now I'm going, man, what is wrong with these people? 430 years they've been looking to go home. 430 years they've been talking about going back home and now they're just at the border. They're at the right place and at the right time. And God has already shown them his power through Pharaoh. He's done ten great miracles in Egypt. He's crossed them over the Red Sea or through the Red Sea. He's brought them into the wilderness. He's made himself known to them in the cloud and in the pillar of fire. God is present. But negativity blinded them. And I want to say something this morning. If you're struggling with negativity, get around some positive people. Get around some people with a hallelujah in their heart and in their spirit and let it rub off on you. Chuck and get rid of, chunk the negativity. It is so infectious and so destructive. It destroyed Israel and their, uh, their, their opportunity to go into the, into the land and possess. Look at Gideon facing the Midianites at the right place and the right time. But where did God find him? Hiding in a wine press, threshing out a little bit of wheat and trying to just get a little bit of grain before the Midianites got it. And an angel shows up to him. And I like what he said. Hell, mighty man of valor. Who are you talking to? I'm Chicken Little. You know, he said, I'm the least in my father's house. And my father's the least in the clan. And our clan is the least in the tribe. He had a bad mentality. But I'm glad this morning, Holy Spirit can wipe that away from us. Hallelujah. And set us free as we get in the word of God. Amen. God saw in him something he could not begin to see in himself. And God sees in you this morning something you don't see in the mirror. He looks beyond your potential and he sees his presence, his power, and his glory. Amen. And what he can do if you just surrender. If you just let God be God in your heart and in your life. David had been anointed to be king over Israel. And I'm sure he sat over there on the hillside with those sheep wondering, okay, God. You've anointed me. What does that mean? I've just gone back to my job. I'm just the last son in my father's house. I'm just keeping sheep. His daddy calls him and says, Son, I want you to run over and take this bread and cheese to the army. Your brothers are over there fighting. Haven't heard from them. I want you to go check it out. And he gets there at the right moment. And God sets him there at the right time. Because what he found when he got there was not a Brave bunch of Israelites battling Philistines. But he got there at the time Goliath was given his challenge and all of the Jewish men were running for their tent. I wonder what their tent was going to do for them. Maybe they just didn't want to be guilty of somehow volunteering, you know, to take on. Because there was a rumor running through the camp the guy that fights this man, the king's going to make him wealthy. The king's going to give him his daughter. The king's going to free his family from taxes. And the reason I say it's a rumor because later if you look at David, David didn't get none of that. But the right place and the right time. And David stood there and listened to that and looked at all of that. And then he opened his mouth and he said what he really felt. I'll go fight him. Why could he say that? Because he hadn't just been idle over there on the hillside watching sheep. He'd been making room. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord's my shepherd, I don't need anything else. Mm, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. You're with me. Hallelujah. Here's the key. He's with you. He's with me today. And we need nothing because he's our all and in all. You know the rest of the story. David defeats Goliath. The right place, the right time. Esther. 
most beautiful girl in all of the domain, now queen in the land. And there's a problem shows up. It's a jealous person, Haman, who wants to eradicate the Jews. Mordecai sent her word back, said, you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I want you to know this morning, you're living for such a time as this. You're living where you are for such a time as this. You're working where you are for such a time as this. You're associating with the people you associate for such a time as this. Amen. This is God's time. This is a great time. This is a time for victory. This is a time for overcoming power. Hallelujah. Naaman stood no chance against God's timing and God's plan and God's opportunity. You know the rest of that story. Listen to this this morning. Spiritual maturity is seeing and seizing God-ordained opportunities. I know we all have to repent because we've let some fly by. We've missed some. And I get that. I'm with you. But I'm praying, God, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see what you're up to. I want to see what you're presenting, what you're setting up, what you're preparing, what you're doing in this hour. Every opportunity is God's gift to you. What you do with that opportunity is your gift to you. To God. Think about it. God gives us the opportunity. And then it is our gift to do His desired will with that opportunity. When Ben and I crossed paths with that line, he had two choices. Run. And I guarantee he thought about it. We all think about it, don't we? That moment when we were trembling, that moment when we look the situation over and the word impossible rushes through our mind and we think there's no way I can go in that pit. There's no way I can deal with him under these circumstances. But I'm glad to know this morning that God's not bound by my circumstances. He's victorious. Hallelujah. He is Lord God Almighty. He had two choices, run or grab life by the mane. And he chose to grab life by the main. He chose to move in to the opportunity that God afforded him. I ask you this question this morning. What does your personal line look like? Every one of us has something that we're looking at, that we're facing, that we're confronted with. What does it look like? Maybe it's a dream God's dropped into your spirit that's so big that it frightens you to death. And you say, I can never rise to that. But I want to tell you what God takes people who are willing. And he works in them things that just become phenomenal and powerful. If we're just willing to say, yes, Lord. Pastor was talking about kids raising their hand, wanting to be a missionary. I'm telling you what, that is a great call, and that is a great opportunity. But it will take a lot of God and a lot of surrender to walk it out and to live it out. I pastored in in Alabama, up near uh, Anniston, Alabama, for seven years. And God had done some phenomenal things. We've been able to build a whole new complex and pay for it, and, and it. God was just working in a beautiful way. Church was happy. I was happy. But down deep in my spirit, there was a little something stirring that it's time to move on. And my vision was northwest Alabama. I drove over northwest Alabama looking for that next church, that next appointment, that next community, that next place to go to. My vision was kind of small. Because when it all washed out, I ended up in Anchorage, Alaska. Now, that's northwest. (laughs) That's a little bit further than I had thought about going. Our lives were totally revolutionized. And we had to learn to trust God on a new level and learn about God in a new way. 
and it revolutionized us, and it was the best thing that ever happened to us. So I want you this morning, don't think too small, but allow God to breathe into you and grow the vision that he has for you as an individual. Maybe your line is a, a bad habit, an addiction, something that you struggle with, that you can't kick, that you've been beaten up by and beaten down by. I've come by to tell you this morning that God's in the business of killing lions. Hallelujah. And when you surrender and allow him to do the work, it's not about you doing it. It's about God. Maybe it's a life-altering financial decision that you've got to make. I want to tell you, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills this morning, and he can afford whatever he dropped into your spirit to do. Maybe it's a cloud of self, self-doubt that casts a shadow on your future. But I've got the news for you this morning. Our future's in him. Our future's in him. Ben and I saw and seized a God-ordained opportunity. We often use the term, no guts, no glory. We really say an intestinal fortitude, the willing to surrender, the willing to say yes to God, yes to the plan of God. You see, how we react when we encounter our lion will determine our destiny. He said over there in the village of Kabzal, and maybe he thought, boy, I'd like to meet David. I'd like to be a part of that great group of guys. Little did he know that his lion adventure would catapult him into a place where he could rub shoulders with great men like David and 36 other great men. When we don't have the guts to step out in faith and chase our line, God is robbed of the glory that rightfully belongs to him. It all is based upon our view of God. If we have a small view of God, then we don't venture out very much. I had a cousin that I was visiting with one day that lives in Florella. And uh, we were talking and he told me, he said, yeah, I, I uh, far north as I ever been was Montgomery. And I'm okay with Florella. And I'm going, oh my God. Your life is so small. Your life, your life is so small. I want to tell you what. We come to church and sing about how big our God is. And the devil wants to crowd us into a little corner somewhere and keep us in, a infant, in, in an infantile state. But God wants to come into our life. Whew, hallelujah. And he wants to set us up. And he wants to move us out. And he wants to promote himself in that he takes that which is weak. Paul said, when I'm weak, he's strong. Hallelujah. And in my weakness, his strength is made known and his strength is revealed. Don't look at your weakness. Look at his strength. Amen. Sing this song again. We were singing just moments ago. He never fails. When you feel weak and just like you can't do it, Find the words of that song and just start singing them again. He never fails. He never fails. You see, our internal picture of God determines everything. If we see God no bigger than our small problems, then our God's pretty small. But if we see him uh, as he is, high and lifted up, and his train filling the temple, hallelujah. If we see him sitting upon his throne, uh, the heavens being his throne, and the earth is his footstool, then we get the clear picture of who God is. A low view of God and a high view of God is a difference between being a scaredy cat or a lion, changer, a lion chaser. The bigger God becomes, the smaller our lines become. You see, he was the son of Jehoiada who knew God. He was Benaniah whom God has built. And he was from the congregation of God. I'm telling you what, it's important to come to church. 
It's important to hang out and rub shoulders with people who are living life like you are, and they're experiencing victory. Amen. They have a high view of who God is. Uh, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Doubts are real. Fears are real. And they plague us all. But the best way to get beyond your doubts and your fears is to get in this book and read it from cover to cover and allow God to speak into your spirit. Get an idea of how God feels about things and how God responds to things and how God works in the life of mankind. You see, the biblical prescription for defeating doubt and fear and becoming a lion killer can be found in Joshua chapter 1 where God said to Joshua, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the laws my servant David, uh, Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful in whatever you do. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to, to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Listen closely. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Hallelujah. We've all felt the terror. We've all had the discouraging moment. But the word of the Lord to us is get this book and read it and meditate on it day and night. Let it be the voice that speaks louder. In your head are many voices that are going off. But let this be the voice that you listen to. Let this be the voice that you obey. Let this be the voice uh, that commands your steps to move forward. Not the discouraging voices that surround you. His commandment to Joshua was be strong and courageous. How do you get strong? I tell you what, making room for him makes you strong. Spending time in his presence makes you strong, equips you and fortifies you. Spending time in the word empowers you and builds a foundation under you. And so his word was be strong. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 through 10 says, For it is by grace we have been saved through faith. And this not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Listen closely to the words of verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, the normal sequence of preparing for a king to go and see a place or visit another land or even in our culture today, if our president is going to travel abroad, there's a team, an advanced team that goes and they prepare. They set up everything. They get everything ready for him. So when he comes, he just fills in the slots that they have set up for him. That's the worldly way of doing it. But let me talk about God's way of doing it. God's way of doing it is he goes in advance of you. He goes before you. We sometimes, I, you know, I get amazed sometimes even at my own prayer. Oh, God, show up. And God said, show up? I was here a long time ago. It's time you show up. Amen? Sometimes I have to stop myself. Oh, oh forgive me, Father. I forgot for a moment. You're already here. You are already wanted to move. You are already wanted to do miracles. You are already wanted to do supernatural things. I've got to show up. In faith and trust you. So the king sends out his servants to prepare. But in God's kingdom, 
He goes ahead of us and he prepares for the miracle. He prepares for the work to be done. Amen. I look at this in a different light this morning and I see that God prepared a Goliath for David. God prepared a lion for Benaniah. God prepared the Midianites for Gibeon. Wasn't it a neat story? They took 300 lamps and trumpets and broke the lamps and blew the trumpet and the Midianites killed themselves. That's a God thing. The thing that you fear the most, the problem that you're quaking and shaking about, God said, ain't no big thing. Let me show you how I can handle that for you. God prepared a Naaman for Esther. God prepared a jail cell for Paul and Silas over in Philippi because he wanted to save a jailer. He wanted to save a jailer's house. And how can you save the jailer unless you go in his house? And they got it, and they understood it. When everybody else would have been cursing and fuming and fussing, Because of their plight and their situation, the word said at midnight, Paul and Silas began to do the unthinkable. They began to sing, and they began to praise God. Hallelujah. And God showed up when they made room for him, amen, in their situation and in their circumstances. You're praying God show up. God said, open the door and make room. Make room. Make preparation. I will, I'll show up when you make preparation. So God has prepared these things in advance for us to do. And when we do them, you know, we don't have a clue of how they're responding in heaven. But I got a feeling that in heaven, when uh, David showed up over at the camp and all the other guys were running to the tents, God the Father, God the Son, knowing their son David and what he was about to do, they probably got up and called a few angels over and said, "Come, you want to see something? Let me just, just look at this, amen. This boy's got it. He knows where his power comes from. He came to Goliath and said, I don't come with sword and spear. I come in the name, hallelujah. I come in the name. I come in the name, hallelujah. And at that name, every knee bows and every tongue confesses, amen. Heaven stands up and heaven shouts and heaven rejoices when we take on the lions in our lives. Listen, Isaiah said 54, 10 and 17, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. No weapon, no weapon, amen? No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage. What a heritage, hallelujah. This is the heritage. This is what we get for being a child of God. Amen. This is what we get for being a servant of the Most High God. No weapon forced against us can prosper. Because we sang it this morning, didn't we? He's never failed. He's never failed. He's never failed. I tell you, when you guys started singing this morning, I went, oh, thank you, Jesus. You set it up well. You set it up well. You made my job easy. Amen. You set it up well. Oh, yes. I want to tell you something about lion chasers. Three things. Number one, they believe they can beat the odds. Don't care what the world says about you and me. Don't care what the world says about us because they're influenced by Satan who is a liar and the father of lies. Oh, but we know that we can beat the odds because of the company we keep. The Lord is with us. Hallelujah. And the Lord is on our side. And the Lord has set up for our victory. And the Lord has prepared for our success. So we know this line's a dead line. (laughs) Don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but this line's a dead line. Oh, yeah. Line chasers believe they can face their fears. Doesn't mean you're 
fearless. We all have fears. Every, we're human, right? And being human, we know the frailty of flesh. We know the frailty of our own life. But we face them. We face them. We face them. And we let God be God for us. Several years ago, I was having some physical problems. I went to the doctor, a neurologist, and he checked me out. And he said, I want to do an MRI. And I'm thinking, you know, that's a long ways from the, neuro- from the urology problem I'm having, you know. But he did an MRI, and he called me back in, and he said to me these wonderful words. In 14 years of practice, you're the second guy I ever saw with this problem. And I'm going, dear Jesus, I didn't want to be number two. Uh -uh. Uh Uh-uh. And what he said next put fear in my heart. Because he said, you have a pituitary tumor about the size of of a baton. I didn't hear him say, Most of these are benign. Darla heard it loud and clear. She was rejoicing. Benign. Hallelujah. We can deal with that. But what I heard was tumor on your pituitary. My father died with a brain cancer. My mom died from cancer. And so when he started talking, fear showed up. We left his office and went down to the car. And Darla looked at me and she said, honey, are you okay? I said, no, not really. She said, it was. He said, it was probably benign. But I heard tumor, and I heard a sentence. But this is how we pray. I want to say something to young people here who are thinking about getting married or dating. One of the things that Darla and I did in our early days of dating relationship is we learned to pray together. There's a prayer room on campus, and we went there every afternoon at 2 o'clock and prayed together, and we developed prayer life before we did anything else. We developed that kind of relationship. So our natural response to problem is, let's pray. Let's pray. And we held hands in that car, and the prayer went something like this. Father, nothing touches us that you haven't permitted. The devil said to Job, I can't get at him. you got a hedge built around him. If you take the hedge down, I can touch him in such ways he'll curse you. And God said, all right, have at him. And God permitted it. And whatever comes into your life is by permission this morning. It didn't just happen. It's just not circumstances. But it has a, a purpose for God to be glorified. You can't have a testimony without a test. And we said to the Lord, you knew this before it ever was div- uh, ever revealed, and we're trusting you. Two years of medications didn't resolve it, and it continued to grow. And the doctor said, we're going to have to operate. I didn't really relish that. They had to go, the pituitary is... They're called the miniature brain of the body. They're right below the brain itself, right behind the optic nerve, and began to that tumor began to affect my vision. We had prayed. People had prayed. I'd taken medication. And nothing had seemed to slow it, the growth of it down. But we went to Portland, Oregon, for a pastor and pastor's wives retreat. And on Saturday morning, we were going to take communion And someone was playing and someone was leading some songs of worship. And we were all worshiping the Lord. And in that time of worship, as we just prepared our hearts and made room for his presence, I felt this warm, warm sensation right here in front of my head. The doctor had told us prior to surgery, he said, we'll go in, we'll get as much as we can. Then you'll have to have radiation, and then you'll have to have medication for the rest of your life to control the growth of this thing. This doctor was a wonderful doctor, but he was an agnostic. Darla worked with him. There was a large surgery center, and she was a RN in the surgery center, and she recovered patients for this doctor 
quite frequently, and so she knew him on a, uh, on a professional level. So the day of surgery came, and, and the surgery was performed. Dar Darla was there. My family were there. Friends were there, different people. And Dr. Higgins came out to give the report, and he came out with a big old smile on his face. And he told Darla, I said, I've never seen nothing like that. He said, it just scooped out. It just came out. The whole thing came out. The next morning, he came to my room where I was. You know, they, after surgery, they give you a self-medicating uh, button. You know, if you feel pain, just push this button. And so I woke up one time in the middle of the night and pushed the button automatically. And the next time I woke up, I was about to push the button, and I thought to myself, why am I doing that? I'm not hurting. I have no pain. So the doctor came in the next morning, and he looked at me and said, on the scale of 1 to 10, what's your pain level this morning? Zero. So the next morning, he came back and asked me the same question. He probably thought I was under the influence that morning. And so he came back the second morning. He said, uh, on the scale of 1 to 10, what's your pain level today? I said, zero. I said, doctor, I've had no pain. I mean, they go up through under your lip and through your nasal passage and back into this part of your head, and, and they take that out, and there should be some kind of discomfort or pain from that. The only discomfort I had was all the garbage I packed up in my nasal cavities, you know. But there was no pain. And for months after that, when he'd see Darla at the surgery center, he'd have this big old smile on his face, and he'd ask her, how's our miracle doing? How's our miracle doing? I could have never got into Dr. Higgins' life any other way. I could have never walked through that process any other way. And so I say it wasn't for my benefit that God did that. It was for Dr. Higgins' benefit that he showed himself strong, that God showed up in a marvelous way. I, I'm glad to be the beneficiary. I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm thankful for what God did for me, but I'm more thankful about what he spoke into that man's life. An agnostic doesn't know if there's a God. And God said, I'm going to show up and show out. <laughs> Amen? I'm going to show up and show myself strong. <laughs> what a mighty God we serve. What an awesome God we serve. You see, lion chasers, uh, chasers believe they can face their fears, and also they believe they have divine purpose. Everyone in this room has divine purpose this morning. Would you stand with me? I want every head bowed this morning. And I simply want you to pray this prayer this moment with me. And the prayer is simple. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this word today? And would you just listen intently to what Holy Spirit is saying to you this morning and respond to him in faith? He knows your situation. He knows your circumstances. He knows your fears. He knows your doubts. He knows your struggles. He sees you right where you are today. But here's the good news. He loves you with a never-ending love. And he cares about you more than you could ever imagine. And he's come this morning to touch your life and to say to you, I'm with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will go with you. And in the process of going, I'll defeat your enemies. I'll destroy your adversaries. No weapon formed against you or forged against you can prosper because you're mine. You're mine, says the Lord. What does it take to experience those victories? Surrender. And letting God be God in your life. 
I'm going to turn this back to Pastor. And I want you to just obey what Holy Spirit is speaking into your heart this morning. As Holy Spirit is moving in this house and He is speaking and breathing hope, life, faith. You say, Steve, I've got to do something with this lion. Either I'm going to run like I have in times past or I'm going to see what God's going to do by taking it. If that lion presents itself to you and you want to take a step, reaching your arm out to grab a hold of your miracle from God, I want you to step forward right now. Just come to this altar. Steve, I got that lion. I've got that lion. Horrible timing. I've got a situation that I don't know how to do with. There's one or two things that are going to happen. Either I'm going to slay it or it's going to slay me. There's no in between, there's no hiding. The timing is inopportune. Except God is an always on time God. I'm going to give just a moment longer. If you're watching by live stream and this has resonated in your heart. Whatever step of faith that you can take to release faith. Because you can believe it, but that faith needs to be released. Faith without works, it's dead. So whatever step that is, if it's raising a hand, if it's stretching out a hand, if it's just standing up, you just follow the prompting and be simply obedient to what Holy Spirit would say to you. But I'm going to wait just a moment longer. Just a moment longer. I want to give you plenty of opportunity because I know how the devil works. He works with me the same way. He's wrestling in our thoughts. and I, I really don't, it's not required to step. No, I, I get it. But when you release faith, the supernatural takes place. There are people right in the front. I'm going to ask our elders, wives, retired pastors, wives, if you would, I want you just to come and help me, staff, come and help me. There are some circumstances that I am quite well aware of. As pastor, I have the privilege, the very distinct privilege of walking with people shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, through good and sometimes very challenging times. I just need you to understand when it's out of your control, that does not mean it's out of God's. Just because you can't move it doesn't mean he can't. Just because you don't know doesn't mean he doesn't know. I feel faith in this house. I, there has just been a sweet presence of Holy Spirit. If you're kind of unfamiliar with a service like this, all I'm asking you to do is just simply be open and say, God... If this is you, just confirm it to me. He has a way of doing that. So for those of you that have come in a step of faith, I would love for you to make another step of resignation. 
casting this at the feet of Christ and surrender to Him by raising your hands if you can physically, if you feel appropriate to get them up. And those that are standing with you, we're going to lay hands on you and we're going to believe that the God that never fails... Your God has never failed. And he's not about to start right now. If you feel like coming and praying with these people, you come on. I want as many people as possible to come. And if you can't come or you don't feel comfortable, I want you to stretch your hand forward this way. But whatever you do, I do not want this to be a moment of spectation. I want you to involve, not to spectate. I want you to involve yourself. If you're filled with baptism of Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, it would be a wonderful opportunity for that gift to start functioning and operating. One can put a thousand to flight to ten thousand. You are not alone in this. You have a family that is with you. Samantha, you are not alone. You have never been alone. (laughs) In the wee hours of the night, he was watching over you. Every tear shed, he was wiping them from your face. Angels have been dispatched. Susan, allow him to reveal himself to you. Our sin will never be greater than his love. Our failure never greater than his forgiveness. If we just ask. I need some intercessors. I need some believers. I need some believers to do some warfare. There's some lions going to be slain here today. And like Samson, you're going to walk back to that lion carcass and you're going to get some honey out of its jaw. <laughs> It's not taking him off guard. What is committed to him, he will keep. He will protect. Peace when you don't understand. Peace when you don't understand. Peace when you don't understand. (laughs) There's some lines falling today. Hallelujah. Those of you watching by live stream, your lions are falling. Your lions are falling. Your lions are falling.
I know the peace speaker. He controls the wind and waves. And when he says peace, be still, they have to obey. Yes, I know him by name. This is the evidence of that line slain. I know the peace speaker. If you know it, sing it out. Yes, I know him by name. I know. Controls the winds and waves, controls the winds and waves. And when he says, Peace, be still, they have to obey. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know the Yes, I know him by name. This last part, sing it one more time. When he says peace, and when he says peace, be still. They have to obey. Yes, I know him by name. Come on, just raise your hands heavenward all over this building. He's about to give you peace like you haven't had in a long time. You are the lion of the tribe of Judah. There is no lion greater than you, Lord. There's something about the evidence of the miracle that always encompasses peace. It doesn't necessarily mean that your trouble is over or the storm is past. Peace doesn't mean the absence of conflict. It is the acknowledgement of the presence of the Lord in the middle of it. In the middle of it. Are you thankful for the word of God? Are you thankful for the man of God? Me too. Ronnie and Beth, come. I I don't want Ronnie to stand alone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you look better with her. That's just... uh, (laughs) So, um, you can face the congregation. Ronnie has uh, asked to become a member of the church. And we've gone through some of the... um, preliminaries and and I think we need to consider it even though he's a preacher's kid I'm just saying (laughs) Uh, but he told me he said this is the first church that I've joined that my parents weren't pastoring that that's reality isn't it that's reality and I so get that and if you're a preacher's kid you get it as well Beth is already a member but um it hadn't been all that long ago that the two became one. 
And I had the distinct privilege of tying that knot, so I just felt it just appropriate for them to come. I want you to stretch your hand forward this way. How many of you know that God is assembling the bride of Christ and He is calling people to this body to accomplish His purpose? This isn't about Steve Pettis. That's why it's important that we do not equate a move to a man. God can move no matter who has the mic, just so it's God. We're going to pray for Ronnie and Beth as a couple. Uh, and um, what this does is just allows for um, the doors of leadership to open. It doesn't mean that they're any more of the family. I don't know how you can get more of the family than what they are. But um, Ronnie's just... That's already a member. Ronnie's just coming in. And uh, I want you to pray for him, okay? I want you to pray for them as a couple. Hey, Father, I thank you that the spirit of Brother Ron and Sister Darla resides in the heart of Ronnie. I thank you for your hand upon his life, the many miles that he puts on the road and the fellowship that you have with him in the cab of that semi. I praise you because he is a hungry heart that is seeking after you. How humbled we are that you would smile on this fellowship and allow such beautiful hearts to come and say, we see what God is doing and we just want to be a part. We, we just want, we want to be a part. Oh God, I pray that you would just anoint Beth and Ronnie and all of their endeavors. Father, I thank you that blessings will just run them smack dab over. And Father, that they would sense you in dealings and ways and futuristic opportunities and prayer requests, Father, like they have never sensed you before. Father, I thank you because of this step that they are taking to commit to the work of the kingdom of God here in Bay Manette. You're going to honor them, I truly believe. Now may your anointing reside upon them in everything that they do. And Father, we thank you for expanding our family. And our table is getting bigger every day. For that, we're so thankful. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. So this is your responsibility. We have guests with us uh, that Kaylee brought. We have guests that uh, Cameron and Caitlin have brought. So I want you to do some neck hugging, handshaking. Now, when you tell them your names, they'll probably forget, but um, you only have to remember a couple, right? I want you to let Ronnie know how glad you are that he is um, he's smack dab in uh, the trenches with us. And uh, let him know how much you appreciate him joining the body of Christ. Listen, this is your opportunity. What you do with it is up to you. Church is out there, not in here. So, Bay Assembly, Bay Online, as always, let's go have church. Bring your biker friends Sunday morning. Be ready for an outside service. It's going to be a blessed day. Amen. God bless you. And we'll see you soon.